Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And uh, we're going to continue looking at de- in detail at um, Daniel chapter 11. And a um, couple of things I want to look at today that we haven't really talked about and see their relevance. But let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. The dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the time that we have again this morning to open your word together. And we invite your spirit to be our teacher. We need you in our lives, and we pray for your angels' care and protection over our loved ones, over our home, and we ask for your Holy Spirit uh, to use us in our contact with others. We ask that as we study your word, that you can uh, help us to have attentive minds, and that we can see things clearly as they related to the past and to the present. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I was going over the history of, well, I worked all the way up to Raphia and a little bit after uh, studying the history of these um, Syrian wars, right? So if we, we go back, you know, we have the Diadaki, Diadaki wars, I think is how it correctly be pronounced, but everybody pronounces it differently, because we're going to have this uh, the king of the north and the king of the south, um, with Ptolemy uh, gaining this all this territory, right? He's going to have this great dominion, and then, and then we're going to get to the end of the the first and second Syrian wars, when Ptolemy the second and Antiochus the first Soter have this agreement, they have this peace treaty, right? So this is going to be ratified um, by uh, marriage of, of um, Ptolemy II's daughter, Berenice, to Antiochus II, Theos, right? But, and then it's retained the power of her arm. She loses her position from the former queen, the Odyssey, which means decision of the people, loses in a democratic process with the election of Trump is what we had. So, so this is going to go back to this history in this line, the way that we had written this out to Trump's election. And so some of this stuff we have to decide, are we applying this correctly in in the present? And and it seems like what we were doing here uh, in verse five and six is that we were, uh, this is almost like a separate line, that this is going to cover uh, this history, you know, up to Biden, which, if we go back then to how, how we look at this, well, this is going to be going uh, when we when we go back here, wherever it is. So, so I haven't decided how how to do that, how we're going to draw out this line in this context, because if we look at the line that we have been drawing out, you know, it's going to not be directly in that history. Verse five and six are not going to be addressing, you know, Trump and Biden, right? So. So we're going to have them, and we haven't put the verses in there, but I mean, we're, we're going back to, uh, the beginning of this line, um, the 777 days, um, starting this line where in some ways the way that we're interpreting these verses is they're actually addressing the 777 days at the end of the line. And I don't know how we, how we address that. So. We have the first Syrian war. Now, technically, the Bible isn't going to talk about anything about the first Syrian war. It's it's talking basically about uh, uh, what happens as far as the end of the Diadochi Wars to the the establishment there of of what's going to start the first Syrian war. It doesn't really address all of the details of it. And then it's going to address the peace treaty at the end of the second Syrian war. So that's really marking the end of these first and second Syrian wars with the marriage of Berenice to uh, uh, um, Antiochus Theos. Is that his name? So that's going to be, yes. Yeah, so Antiochus II Theos. And then we have the third Syrian war, also called the Laodicean War, because it's going to be... uh, And there's a lot of complexities in that war um, because you're going to have the murder of Berenice and her son and the death of Theos. 
um, Antiochus the second Theos, and then uh, Sileia DC. Um, it's going to be her son, Antiochus. Is it Antiochus the third? Seleucus, I can't remember. Um, who's then going to be? So there's going to be this war then with um, and Ptolemy the third, I believe, is is uh, the king in this third Syrian war. So I just need to look at these. Right. So you're going to have, yeah. <clears throat> so Ptolemy declares war against Laodice's newly crowned son, Seleucus II. So that's going to be the start in 246, right? That's the third Syrian war. And, and that's described in detail in Daniel. So it doesn't really describe the details of the first and second Syrian war. It hints at them, I guess. And then you're going to get to this third Syrian war. And so we have these symbols, the 252, the 271, the 246. These are iterations, the 246 and the 271 of, you know, July 20, 21st and also of uh, 264, 26th day of the fourth month. But they're iterations of it. And then, of course, we, we come to Raphia. Now, Raphia is going to be part of the fourth Syrian war. Now, when Raphia is conquered in that history, there is, there is a document that most of us are familiar with, at least we've heard of. And it talks about that history. This is a document called the Rosetta Stone. So does anybody know what's written on the Rosetta Stone? The Rosetta Stone, the artifact, doesn't it have at least three different languages, Egyptian, Greek, and one other that helped to? Yeah. So it has the Egyptian hieroglyphics. Okay. And Demotic, which is, Demotic, Demotic is the language of documents, but it's Egyptian. So there's two Egyptian languages. And then it has Greek. Okay. So, so um, I'm just trying to see if I can find a good translation of it. Um, so we know that it, it's because prior to that, it's it's found in, I believe, 1799. And then uh, this this is used to understand Egyptian hieroglyphics. So before that, nobody knew how to read the hieroglyphics. But once they had the Rosetta Stone, they had a key with these two other languages to um, to be able to translate the Egyptian hieroglyphics so they could then read um, these things, right? So I'm just trying to find the text here. So it's going to be describing this history uh, just after the Battle of Raphia. Well, it's also interesting because this was based on a decree that was issued in 196 BC by Ptolemy V Epiphanes. Yes, so it's going to be Ptolemy V. So that's the, he's, I think he's the six year, six year old son of Antiochus or Ptolemy the, the fourth. So Ptolemy the fourth is the one who's going to gain this territory of, um, uh, Raphia, right? So I'm just trying to figure, so, so it's Ptolemy the fourth who, who wins the Battle of Raphia. So June 22nd, 217. I'm just going to read this here quickly. Um, yeah, so it's Ptolemy the fourth. So he wins this Battle of Raphia. So, so one of the things I was just thinking about, okay, we have this Battle of Raphia and then we have this document of Rosetta Stone that's issued by Ptolemy the fifth and and I don't know what he's going to do is he's going to try to placate the people. So what ended up happening is after the Battle of Raphia, uh, there was a rebellion in Egypt. So Ptolemy the Fourth wasn't very popular. When he dies, um, and I can't remember how he died, but his his six year old son Ptolemy the Fifth comes to the throne, and in order to placate, now I'm not sure that he really knows what he's doing. It's probably somebody else, but uh, to placate the people, he gives all kinds of gifts to the priests. And then the Rosetta Stone is about 
um, basically all these concessions that he's making, uh, lowering taxes or not raising taxes and things like that, to sort of, as you have this tide turning against the king of the south, we'll say, Egypt, um, this is a way to sort of placate things. And the, and the question I have, and I'm just trying to find the text, is does that have any relationship to our history? Maybe something that hasn't happened yet, but is going to happen. So, so I have here, uh, the translation of it. Um, I'm going to share this on the screen. And, and I just started studying this this morning. So it was on my other computer. So it's, um, the decree of the priest of Memphis is found on the Rosetta Stone and on the Stele of Damahur. The decree was promulgated in the ninth year of the reign of Ptolemy V Epiphanes. So if it's the ninth year of his reign and he was six when he came to reign, that would make him about 15. On the 24th day of the month, uh, Europaeus, which corresponded to the 24th day of the month of the season, Pert, of the inhabitants of Tamert, Egypt, in the 23rd year of the reign of Horus Ra, the child who hath risen as king upon the throne of his father, lord of the shrines um, of Nechibet and Ukratek, the mighty one of the twofold strength, the stabilizer of the two lands, the beautifier of Egypt, whose heart is perfect or benevolent toward the gods, right? So he's got all this stuff here. Um, the son of Ptolemy and Ars, Arsene, how do you say that again? Arsene away. Arsene away. Like, no way. Okay. The father loving gods. When Ptolemy, the son of Pyrides and the priest of Alexander and of the savior gods and the brother loving gods and beneficent gods. So there's a lot of stuff in here about the different gods. The daughter of Cadmus was the basket bearer of Arsinoe, the brother loving goddess. When Irene, the daughter of Ptolemy, was the priest of Arsinoe, the father loving goddess. All this stuff here. So it's just all this introductory things. Um, and then it's going to go to so all the, how nice he is under his reign as regards the sums which were due to the royal house from the people of Egypt and likewise those which were due from everyone. It was his August service. His majesty remitted them altogether, howsoever great they were. Right. Talks about the taxes he, and hath given unto his soldiers who are, um, in his august service, according to their rank and of the taxes, some of them hath he cut off and some of them he hath lightened, thus causing the soldiers and those who live in the country to be prosperous. Now, how would we apply something like this to our history? So we have the Battle of Raphia, um, and, and we have here a Ptolemy V. So he's this, uh, you know, very young king. Is, does this relate to our history or not? Um, I mean, th this is obviously a political propaganda and, and a way to sort of placate the people in the, in, in that history. Um, because it says here, um, he hath commanded two thirds of them shall be returned to the priests, talking about these, uh, fees they pay. His majesty hath reestablished all things, the performance of which has been set aside and hath restored them to their former condition. He hath taken the greatest care to cause everything which ought to be done in the service of the gods to be done in the same way in which it was done in former days. I don't think saying is correct. I think it should be same. Similarly, he hath done all things in a right and proper manner, and he hath taken care to administer justice to the people, even like Toth, the great, great God, and he hath moreover ordered in respect of those of the troops who come back and the other people also who during the strife of the revolution, which took place, had been ill disposed towards the government, that when they return to their homes and lands, they shall have the power to remain in possession of their property. And he hath taken great care to send infantry and cavalry and ships to repulse those who were coming against Egypt by land as well as by sea. And he hath consequence expended a very large amount of money of, and of grain on them in order to make prosperous lands of Horus in Egypt. His Majesty marched against the town of Shechem, which is in front of the town of Usiet, which was in the possession of the enemy and was provided with catapults and was made ready for war with weapons of every kind. The rebels who were in it now, they had committed great acts of sacrilege in that land of Horus and had done injury to those who dwelt in Egypt. His Majesty attacked them by making a road to their town. 
and he has raised mounds or walls against them, and he dug trenches. And whatsoever would lead him against them, he made. And he caused the canals which supplied the town with water to be blocked up, a thing which none of the kings who preceded him had ever been able to do before. And he expended a large amount of money on carrying out the work. And his majesty stationed infantry at the mouths of the canals in order to watch and guard against them. So there's all of these things that he's doing because of what had happened with this revolution. Now, I know you're just kind of looking at it for the first time, but is there any way in which we can understand this Rosetta Stone and this history? Because um, it's not specifically mentioned in scripture. I'm just looking through this here quickly. There's a lot of stuff about priests and different things they're going to do. Okay. This is also on the stele of Damaher, right? So they got some stuff in italics that's added. Um, okay. <clears throat> so what do people think about this? Is this something that we should look at and consider? Because we've got this Battle of Raffia, and we're putting it as January 6th. Now, the Battle of Raffia is going to be fought by Ptolemy the fourth, and it's going to be Ptolemy the fifth who then tries to placate everybody after this rebellion. Is, is there any way that we can apply this? So this would be you know going more over to these verses here. Okay, first off, yeah, Battle of Raffia took place on the twenty second of June of 217 BC, right? Yeah. So it took place several years before Ptolemy the fifth was even born. Yes. So it's going to be under Ptolemy the fourth that you have the Battle of Raphia. And then you're going to have this rebellion that goes on. Right. And then Ptolemy the fourth is going to die. And then his son is going to become, you know, the king of Egypt. And then nine years after that, he's going to do this Rosetta stuff, right? So, but, you know, we, we don't have to accept, you know, that these are referring to individual people. They can be referring to just events, right? Okay. So. Now, as I had looked at this, I could, I could buy off on Ptolemy V either being 15, or as I first looked at this, possibly being 13, when this Rosetta Stone was inscribed. Okay. But it's also interesting that the Rosetta Stone becomes known to the world during the year that we would consider the time of the end, because it's found in 1799. Yeah. So it's it's showing God's providence in helping us first to be able to understand these quote dead languages. Well the one dead language. Egypt Egyptian hieroglyphics. Yeah. Well, while I realize that a lot of the more studious people would have understood Greek at that time, how many people are there that were speaking uh, in ancient Greek? Even well, in Greek, no, nobody's speaking in ancient Greek, but they were still speaking Greek. Right. And they were still speaking Egyptian. I mean, these are older, older forms of these languages, though, so, yeah. Okay. Now, Ptolemy V is giving honor to his predecessors but also trying to take some of that honor for himself. Would that be a correct thought? Well, I, I, he's trying to make up for what happened during the t reign of his dad. Okay. Right. So his dad was very unpopular. A rebellion happened. And so when he becomes uh, king, he has to deal with this rebellion. And so in the ninth year of his reign, he issues this um decree the Rosetta Stone to be placed in these various temples with the three languages. That's part of the the the, the text of the Rosetta Stone. Is that instructions are given there in regard to what, what should happen with it. So you know it, yeah. it it's it's being understood. It's it's 
at that time, but we don't get it translated until much later, right? So I can't remember what year I'm trying to find when it was translated. Well, they, they began really going through this for the translation in 1801, 1802. Yeah, I'm just trying to see exactly. Um, so it says here, yeah, so it was Napoleon's campaign in 1798 in Egypt where they're going to have this, and it's going to be um, on July 15th, 1799, that they're going to find this slab. Right. Uh, and then it goes from the French to the British, and it's going to be... The Demotic text was the first of those that they were able to begin working with, but the actual understanding, the breaking out what this, what the Rosetta Stone was saying, was published in 1811. Yeah. yeah. Sylvester de Sacy. Yeah. So he's going to be the one that figures it out. And he had already been working on trying to understand Egyptian hieroglyphics before uh, the Rosetta Stone was found. Okay. So people had been trying to interpret Egyptian. Um, you even have like 1761, Jacques Barthélemy had suggested that the characters in the cartouches and hieroglyphic inscriptions were proper names. And that was one of the key uh, to understanding um, uh, the Rosetta Stone. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there was another uh, interesting date in here just of the date that um, – is let me see here so when it's issued or when it's it's dated um is march 27th 196 bc that's the 18th of mecca so i'm just going to check what we got here on the egyptian calendar so that's the ninth year of ptolemy's reign i'm just making sure that that's what i have yeah so that's going to be the yeah, that's correct. So, so March 27th is an interesting date. Oh, for many reasons. Yeah, so it relates to the message to the Levites. Just looking at the Babylonian calendar, it's the sixth day of the 12th month on the Babylonian calendar. And it's the 26th year of Antiochus III. And it's lunation number 186, which is the number of days, if you go backwards from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month cardinal count. Okay. It's issued on a Sunday, March 27th, 196 BC. Okay. Um, but what about, uh, so it, so it has some symbolic application. How would we understand it in, in, in what its content is and, 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 you know, who wrote it? I mean, is it referring to something in the future as a symbol? So, so we have here in our chart, we have the Battle of Raphia. We mark it with January 6, 2021, right? That's, that's how we have been doing it. And we're saying that the Rosetta Stone is in between that period, between the Battle of Raphia and the Battle of Paneum. It's a propaganda piece to some degree. It's meant to placate, uh, the rebellion against Egypt. And we talked yesterday, is there sort of a turning of the tide against the king of the south, against the Democrats, against wokeism, you know, all of that? And we would say yes. So is there some way in which the the Democrats are going to try to placate that turning against them by these concessions? I mean, that's just a question I'm asking. Would, would the Rosetta Stone have anything to do with that? And we also have it connected to the March 27th date. So that's a message to the Levites. So, you know, I'm just throwing this at you now. So, you know, the question is, should we consider it further? I would think we're going to have to. Yeah, I, I think we kind of have to, you know, because it's part of that history, but it has these symbols attached to it. Now, now what about the symbols of the three languages and the understanding of the script? What what would that symbolize? Well, in this situation, since you've got the Egyptian hieroglyph and the ancient Greek, 
you're dealing with an artifact that is giving testimony about both the king of the north and the king of the south. Okay. Because we're dealing with the basically the proclamation that the king of the south had been able to defeat the king of the north, and it's kind of a warning. Would you agree with that? It's a warrant The Rosetta Stone's a warning? Well, in, in other words, what they're trying to do in producing this is they're trying to say that Egypt, the king of the south, yeah. is able to overcome the power of the greater force of the king of the north. Yes, right. So, I mean, obviously, they're setting themselves against the king of the north. So so one of the things that we have never really studied in this history, because when we study Raphia and Paneum, you know, we just hear about the Battle of Raphia, the king of the south wins, you know, the king of the south, which at that time is Ptolemy IV, you know, he's overconfident, and then, you know, he's going to lose the Battle of Paneum. But, you know, you're dealing with something that's... um you know, 17 years later or whatever, right? And he's going to die in that time. So he's not going to be the one that's defeated, right? We just, I mean, I always just, you know, we talk about the king of the north, the king of the south. We don't think about the change in in who is king, right? Generally, we just we just skip over all of that. Right. So, but now we have the Rosetta Stone in there which is a new king who is trying to uh, stop this rebellion from happening. So the rebellion, we don't really generally address that there is this uh, dissatisfaction with, um, you know, the people who won that battle, for instance, in the Battle of Raphia. I mean, they want independence. They say, well, we're able to take care of ourselves. We don't really want to be part of, the king of the, of, of the empire of Egypt. You want to be independent, right? That's why it's, it's like a, a revolt or whatever against the king of the south. And, you know, the question is, does that parallel anything in our history um, that exists prior to the Battle of Raphia or the Battle of Paneum, I mean? So, so we have the Battle of Raphia. And we've always talked just basically about, you know, this, this persecution that happens. But we, we don't actually ever talk about the context of why it happens. It happens because of a rebellion. I mean, there's two things happening. There's this persecution. The idea was that, you know, uh, the king of the south after the battle of Raphia, that originally we were saying that was Russia and that Russia was going to, um, be in persecuting Christians. This was back in, in 2017. We were talking about this. And of course we changed our minds. And 2017, prior to us even having a date for this, we were talking about Russia, right? So before we have the November 9th date. So that was our understanding about Rafi and Paneum, when we first start understanding Rafi and Paneum, this battle between Russia and the United States, which it didn't pan out to be. So so now we have this Rosetta Stone in there, which, which I think is significant. And... It's not in the scriptures. It doesn't specifically talk about the Rosetta Stone. But it does talk about the Ra- Raphi and Paneum. And this is part of the historical events in that time. So is this saying anything about what's going to happen prior to the battle of Paneum? So Paneum is, so that means what there is, is there's this attempt to to hold together the king of the, the kingdom of the south through all these concessions, but ultimately they're going to lose this battle in Paneum, right? So this is long after the battle of Raphia, you know, battle of Raphia is 217. This is going to be 196. So you're looking at and, and exactly, I'm just looking here at these dates of these kings. Yeah. So Ptolemy the fourth, dies in two let me see when does he he must die in 221 or does he begin reigning so is it ptolemy the third who does the battle of raphia no no it's ptolemy okay never mind it's ptolemy the fourth he becomes king in 221 so the battle of raphia is in 217 and then ptolemy the fifth 
he becomes king in 203. So, so if you look at 203 and 196, that looks like seven years, right? But it's in the ninth year of his reign. So it just has to do with when he comes into his reign. And I'm looking here at these, uh, yeah, it has always here with this, uh, Egyptian calendar. I don't have, I know I have a page that addresses this. Okay. I'm going to try to get this date here. So we're going to go to, how do I do this? <clears throat> Buy this. Uh, I'll just show you what I'm doing here. This is a, a, a website that, that I use sometimes for the kings of Egypt. And it gives me all these different uh, dates. So it's going to start. Uh, with Alexander the Great, and then you're going to get to so Ptolemy the fourth, Ptolemy the fifth. Okay, go to one. Oh, there it is at the bottom. So they're going to have um, the year one of Ptolemy the fourth is from uh, the 18th of October in 222. They have 221 on our chart. So, so this is going to be just when his first year begins. So it's not counting his accession year. And then you're going to have the next one, Ptolemy V. That's going to be October 13th, 205 BC. So in our chart, we have 203. So I'm not sure why, if these dates are correct that we have. So I'm going to have to, right. So when we look at this, they're saying that his first year is going to be in 205. This one says 203. So if I was going to put this, that would be according to this other program website. So it has, it has different dates. So it's just something to, I mean, I'm going to do that for now. I might come back and change that some other time. I got to look these up more closely, but anyway, you got Ptolemy the fifth and he's then going to, issue this Rosetta Stone. And is it is it something that that is happening now? Is there something that we could connect it to that has happened? Or is it something that's still going to happen? Yet there's a third option. Okay. Is it currently happening? Okay. Is it currently happening? Now I mean, what's currently happening as far as uh, this preparation for this election coming up? I mean, I, I, I find it kind of, for lack of a better word, flabbergasting to understand American politics. Thanks. So the Americans seem to want to have Biden run against Trump, right? That's the way it looks. Do the Democrats actually believe that Biden's going to be alive when the election happens? I don't think they've they've fully considered this. I mean, he's on his last legs. Right? He's I mean, been on his last legs since 2020. Yeah, I mean, he he could die anytime soon. Now, I mean, I've heard rumblings, you know, on the internet about you know they want to get rid of Kamala Harris. Okay, that's nothing new. Yeah, because they they need somebody else in in that place in the vice presidency. So if Biden does die or something happens, then, you know, there would be somebody else as president because Kamala Harris would not be a very good president by anybody's uh, imagination, really, except maybe hers. So a very unpopular person. Uh, I just don't understand why the like, I mean, they're having primaries with the Democratic Party. Are they having other people running against Biden? I don't. Not so far. Okay, so. So what happens in American politics if, like, they have this whole process of leading, getting the leader for the party, right? Correct. Okay. And so what happens if, if Biden dies before the election? They just appoint somebody as the leader of the party? Or does the vice president become the leader of the party? How does that happen? Okay. If you, if you were to look back <clears throat> and consider what happened in 1968, you had the president at that time, Lyndon Baines Johnson, choose not to run because he was highly unpopular because of the war in Vietnam. Okay. You have 
Bobby Kennedy, former attorney general of the U.S. that is running, but you also have Hubert Horatio Humphrey, which was the current vice president at that time. Okay. You come all the way down to the California primary. And at the time of the California primary, Bobby Kennedy wins enough delegates to become the Democratic nominee for president. Okay. The night of his victory in California, as he is walking through the hotel and going through the hotel kitchen to his, you know, where he was staying. Yeah. Bobby is assassinated. Yeah. Now you come to Chicago for the Democratic convention and they have a very disorganized convention and it becomes Humphrey that is selected as nominee. Now, Humphrey had been Johnson's running mate in 1964. He was a Minnesota senator. He was extremely left-wing. Extremely okay. progressive at that, as what they called it at that time. Nixon, who had run against John Fitzgerald Kennedy in 1960, mm-hmm. eight years earlier, had not been a a popular choice. He was not seen as being presidential. Okay, but now he is. He becomes president because he's seen as being the the president that will bring people together because Humphrey was seen as being so divisive. Okay. Now so that's when he wins. That's, that's when Nixon wins. Nixon wins by a huge landslide in 1972 and resigns in 1974. Yeah. So probably uh, Bobby Kennedy would have been the president of the United States if he was alive. Bobby Kennedy would have been the president in 68 had he lived. Yeah. Okay. Now, last night in Nevada, they had a, a presidential non-binding primary. On yeah, the- I don't really understand this, this stuff with these primaries. They're very confusing. Every area is different and, yeah. Okay. The Iowa caucuses revealed that there was a strong pro-Trump sentiment. The same thing happened in New Hampshire. Yeah. Nevada last night, which is a non-binding primary, Mm -hmm. did not have Trump on the ballot because Nevada had not allowed his name to be on the ballot. Yeah, so he's he's not on the ballot. Okay. Go ahead. And so Nikki Haley still loses it. Yep. Which I don't understand. I'm just looking at the news here. I didn't know they were. Okay. Well, just Nikki Haley, of course, had been one of Trump's. She she was the delegate to the United Nations for Trump. Oh, yeah. So she was one of, of Trump's employees at that time. Yeah. So she's on the ballot. And she loses to, you know, basically somebody else because Trump is not running and on that ballot. Yeah. So nobody wants to to choose her at all. So at this point, the question becomes what what will happen to the delegates for Nevada? And likely they're going to go to the convention and they'll be free to vote for whomever they they feel like voting for. Now you say it's a non-binding? Correct. And and most of the people voted not for any of the candidates. Correct. Okay. Now what does it, so so is it always non-binding or, or I don't It it depends entirely on the state. Okay. But Nevada's always non-binding? So it it's takes time to, but, okay. This one was a non-binding. I don't understand why. Now okay. we've had we've had other areas where 
the delegates that are sent are bound to a specific candidate. Now, we ran in through this during the election in 2016 because there were a, a set of electors that did not wish to vote for the person that they were told to vote for, that they were bound to. Okay. And those electors became addressed as faithless electors. Okay. So what's going to play out right now, Biden is running. He ran fairly well in South Carolina because he made a huge appeal to many of the black voters in that state. Okay. If we get to the point before the conventions and Biden dies, then we're yeah. stuck with Harris being as president. Right. But only briefly. But only briefly is correct. So Harris could be then typified by Ptolemy the Fifth. By Ptolemy the Fifth. Okay. That's kind of what I was thinking, you know, a possibility. And then she would have to make all kinds of concessions. Yeah. Right. To try to, I don't know, uh, but, but who would be, who would be the one uh, running? Would it just be her then based on well, what happened? She would be the one against Trump. It would be Harris against Trump. And I mean, here's, here's the rest of the, the situation to consider. Biden and Trump are basically the same age. Biden is older. Yeah, he's older. Yeah. Biden's cognitive abilities have been seen to being in great decline. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's even way worse than he was when he got elected. And he was pretty bad then. But now he's, I mean, and, and just even his body movements and everything show that he's he's not very well. Well, I mean, his speech the other night where he was discussing that he was, had, had recently met with Francois Mitterrand of, of France. And I mean, Mitterrand's been dead since 96. Yeah. Well, you know, he could have met with him, you know, just in, you know, his mind. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm aware, but I mean, to have recently met with a dead man, that's wonderful. Yeah. So, um, okay. So, so we have that. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if we're making a prediction about what's going to happen. Well, but I, I just have a hard time believing that, that, that they would still want Biden to run. I mean, I mean, he's extremely unpopular and, and, and even people who may like him would say, well, and his running mate's still going to be, uh, Kamala Harris? It's possible. Because cause, cause can he pick a different running mate? You know, Certainly. once he. Okay. So Certainly. he may pick someone else. Well, okay, I'll use it as an example. Who was Lincoln's vice president nominee in, in 1860? I don't know. Shiler Colfax. Who was Lincoln's vice president nominee in 1864? I don't know. Andrew Johnson. Okay. So you had different people. And you pick your running mate, though, once you win the primaries? Well, okay. I mean, I know they didn't, they didn't announce, you know, who their running mates were, you know, as soon as the, in, when they were in the primaries before. Lincoln chose Colfax because he had been – a, a rep, I believe he was a senator from the state of Maine. Yeah, so sometimes what they're doing is they're picking a running mate who maybe did well, like ran against them in the primaries, like somebody who supported them or maybe turned, you know, to support them, you know, when they had the convention type of thing, and then they pick their running mate. Is that how it happens generally? Uh, it, that's a that's a question. Um. If I if I look at the situation between JFK and LBJ, 
1960. The reason that, that Kennedy was advised to select Johnson, who had run against him in the primaries, was that Johnson, as a current Texas senator, was seen as being able to bring in much of the Southern vote for a Northeastern liberal that, I mean, was fairly unknown. So that's that's one way that that happened. Now, Nixon, when he ran in 1968, selected Spiro Agnew of Maryland because Agnew was seen as being a law and order candidate. And that's the way Nixon ran. But Agnew had to resign in 1973 because it was found that that he'd been very corrupt. He was not law and order. So sometimes presidents are running because they they choose a running mate that's going to give strength to their ticket the way that it was originally done. Whoever won the most votes became president and whoever had the second most votes became vice president, which okay. led to interesting combinations. Okay. Hmm. So, so what we're saying here is that if Biden, I mean, if Biden dies at this point, like if he died tomorrow, would, would there, would there be somebody else who then gets picked besides Kamala Harris. It's possible. Okay. But if it's going to be later, like after the convention, then it would just generally be the vice president who would then be the head of the party. That'd be correct. Okay. So, I mean, it it could be somebody else. Biden could die soon and it could be somebody else who ends up, uh, you know, getting the nomination. But right now, they just want Biden. At this point. Yeah. So, you know, well, maybe they can keep him alive, you know, with AI or something like that. Oh, that that would be so wonderful, wouldn't it? To have an imaginary president. Well, it's not much different right now. I, I'm surprised they're not using AI for him doing his speeches. But so, yeah, so, so we don't know what's going to happen. But we do have the Battle of Raphia. We mark in this line that we have, whether this is a, a zoomed in line or something, or whether this is the actual line that we have. This is what we have. We have this 9-11 and 11-9, this pandemic, dealing with the third Syrian war. And then we have the fourth Syrian war. That's going to be the Battle of Raphia. So that's going to be within those 777 days. And then, and then we're going to have the Battle of Panean, and that's future, and that's going to be the backlash to wokeism. But in between there, there is going to be this attempt to placate the King of the South is going to try to placate his followers. <clears throat> but it shows that there's going to be a different uh, King of the South if if we're going to take this history and apply it there. That is, it wouldn't be Biden. So, I mean, obviously on this part, it's speculation if that's how it's going to happen. If it's going to happen within this history, like immediately, if that's what it's talking about. It right. could also be referring to something much later, right? That Correct. Is, the Battle of Pinion may be something much later, you know, a couple of years, a few years down the line. We don't know. Maybe we could look at you know, the rebellion is is occurring and it's still going to occur. And then at some time in the future, uh, the Democrats are going to have a new leader. And, and that leader is going to seek to placate, you know, people. But but the Battle of Padium will will still be lost to the Democrats at some point. And now, as far as Trump becoming president, I mean, the question is, is that the Battle of Paneum, if Trump becomes president. And and a lot of it depends on what he actually does. But, you know, I've always taken it the, the point that, well, it seems like if January 6th is the Battle of Raffia, 
once the Republicans get back in power and they fight against all of this. Well, first they, they get back in power, but they, they have to actually fight against this wokeism. This wokeism, in a sense, needs to be undone in order for that to be the battle of Pinea, right? Now, some people would put then the Sunday law there. Trump's going to become president. He's going to bring in the Sunday law, which I don't see happening. And it, definitely not the Sunday law that we're talking about on a big line. And Trump's already been part of the Sunday law in a typical sense, right, during the pandemic. Like Xerxes, he was deceived into his actions during that pandemic. But, you know, then we have the Battle of Raffia. So, so we have, you know, Trump loses. We have the globalists in charge and, you know, the end of the United States in that line. But then we have the Battle of Panium. So Trump becoming president again, obviously, isn't, isn't a fulfillment of that prophecy dealing with Trump and, and how we look at him as Xerxes. Or, or is he, right? Is there something here that we, we don't understand in how we've applied this, you know, dealing with the story of Esther, which is a whole other study. But, but you see what I'm saying here that, that there is something about this Rosetta Stone that can tell us something about our history. We just don't know where to place it exactly. We know it's between Rafi and Panean. We just don't know. We don't have a date for it. Right. But in this in this type of a situation, we do have some precedents to be able to look at. I mean, should Biden die after this great battle that he's had ongoing with Trump over these last four years? And then we have Harris, who is, I mean, at best, a placeholder. I mean, Biden's a placeholder as well, but Harris would even be a smaller placeholder. Then the question becomes, how do we view this in in the line of what we're seeing here in Daniel 11? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so when we have, you know, if we look back at our notes here, what we have, you know, suggested regarding this this history so we're going to go, this is the Battle of Raffi. The king of the South, Ptolemy IV, atheistic communism, shall be moved with collar, raise a large army, the governments of the world, and shall come forth and fight with him, continue the fourth Syrian war, atheistic revolution, even with the king of the North, Antiochus III, the two-horned power. So this is an attack against the United States, even though this power is with, you know, it, it conquers the United States. Right. So this atheistic communism is going to conquer the United States. And he Antiochus the third, the USA shall set forth a great multitude, a large army propaganda by the multitude. Antiochus is army's people or but the multitude shall be given into his hand. Ptolemy's control. The population submits to to this neo communism. OK. Ptolemy the fourth would defeat Antiochus the third in the Battle of Raphia. Now put here the great reset set in place equals midnight when he Ptolemy the fourth atheist to communism has taken away the multitude Syrian army apostate Protestantism. So we have a lot in here that, that, uh, I don't know if it makes sense, you know, based on what we have been studying. So then we're going to have the fifth Syrian war, which is going to be this civil war in the United States. So the, the, the Republican in the USA stands up, makes war propaganda against the King of the South, Ptolemy IV, Philopater. Now, in this case, I'm not really sure why, because this is going to be Ptolemy. It's not going to be Ptolemy IV in this history of the Fifth Syrian War, right? So I'm not sure why they have Ptolemy IV. So in the Fifth Syrian War, it's going to be a Ptolemy the fifth, right? Is that who we have? Yeah, it says, well, Antiochus the third would defeat Ptolemy the fifth, Epiphanes, at the Battle of Paneum. But, um, so in the start of the fifth Syrian war, that wouldn't be Ptolemy the fourth. That'd be Ptolemy the fifth. 
So Ptolemy IV defeats Antiochus III in the Battle of Raphia, 217. Yeah, because the, the Fifth Syrian War would have taken place about 202 BC and would have gone on for a period of about seven years. Yeah. And, and since Ptolemy the Fourth died in 204 BC, even if they had AI at that time, he wouldn't have been able to lead the battles. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so you got Tychus the Third, so the, he's there, and then you got Ptolemy the Fifth. So that's going to be the Battle of Paneum. Because it, it's also interesting that two years into this battle, that Rome comes to Antiochus to ask them to refrain from invading Egypt. Right. And yeah, so this is going to be, uh, Rome is going to be in this history. So that's what we get in verse 14. And that's during the fifth Syrian war, right? That right. that's going Okay. Now, and the other one do you hear dealing with, with um, when Ptolemy the fourth wins, his heart shall be lifted up and he shall cast down many tens thousands, right? So this persecution and population control is what we put here in, in our history. That's, that's occurred in our history. We would call it that. But in that history, it, it's during this uh, rebellion, right? So it's not just that he's, he's, he's acting in this way on his own accord. It's because there's a rebellion that he's going to have to fight against his own people. Right, persecute his own people. But he's not going to be strengthened by it. He's not going to complete the conquest of Syria historically. Neither we have, will not weaken the USA. Okay, so I'm not sure why we put that there. For the king of the north, Antiochus the third, the USA shall return and set forth a multitude greater than the former, the start of the fifth Syrian war. So at the start of the fifth Syrian war, that's going to be, uh, not, that's not, that's going to be who? Fifth Syrian War, you're going to have Ptolemy V as, as the king of Egypt. We had this thing dealing with certain years. Yeah, so so what we had happening here, and this is where, where I have this. Um, okay, so when we deal with this um, this Fifth Syrian War, so we're saying the Fifth Syrian War is the Battle of Paneum. That's where that occurs, right? So this is a history that still we have not come to in this line that we're drawing. For the king of the north, the United States, and Tychus the third in this case, but this is this we're saying is referring to the United States as a Republican nation um, that has had been defeated, right, in the Battle of Raphia, shall return and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former. So this is going to be the start of the fifth year war, and it's a response to atheistic communism. And she'll certainly come after certain years with a great army and with much riches. Tychus III would defeat Ptolemy V, Epiphanes, in the Battle of Paneum, 200, 200 BC, whatever, 201, driving out Egypt, driving Egypt out of Judeo Palestine once and for all, right? So as far as God's people are concerned, um, at that time that you have uh, the king of the south is pushed out. Right? His globalism, atheistic communism is defeated. That's what's supposed to happen at the Battle of Pania. And then we have this, this phrase, though, after certain years. Now, we, we looked at the word certain before, um, and, and it's kind of, uh, um, so just going to go back here. So this is the H6256. So it's kind of weird that they translate this as certain because it's the same word that's translated as times, right? And it represents a year. So, I mean, they could have said after year years if they wanted to, but, but they're two different words, right? So this, this word certain, I'm just going to look at this again, just make, just to be certain. It means time. That's what it means, not years, but time. So after time years, that's right. But it can refer to, yeah, so so they use it first when we run into it. Um, yeah, in these times, it uses it in verse 6. 
Um, that's times, so times years, I guess. Okay, so we got that straight. So, so after certain years. So when we, we go to this after certain years. So the, the word years, uh, 8141, 22 years and 105 days. And we noted that from September 11th, 2001 to December 25th, 2023 is an inclusive count of 8,141 days. When we consider this with 6256, both marking December 25th. So the 6256 is just, if you count from November 9th, you get to December 25th using that number. Together, they are a period of 14,397 days. So if you add them together and you include the symbolism of 360 from the number 6256, you get a period of 14,757 days, which is the number of days from November 9th, 1989 to April 5th, 2030. So we had drawn this out. Now we have a drawing of it. How did we do this? So what, what, what he ended up having, I'm just trying to, I'm looking at a chart here and trying to figure this out. So if we start on November 9th, 1989, yeah, there's 14,757 days to April 5th, 2030. And, and so we always have to consider that that date, even though it's symbolic, uh, we can't just dismiss it. So if we count from November 9th, I think we did this at some point brings us to December 25th, and then we count 360 days. It brings us to September 11th, 2007, and then we do the 8141 days that brings us to, I'm not sure what I did. So that all works out. Now, so the question that we have to ask ourselves in in regard to these lines, so, so when we're looking at, let me go to this chart here. So we have this April 5th, 2030 date, and it's it's part of this structure. So this this structure um, comes from this whole situation dealing with the battle of of, of Rafi and Padilla. So I'm just gonna put this down here, even though I have it on some other charts. So certain years, certain is six two H H six six two five six plus 360, and then years, 8141. So this is going to equal one. Okay, so that's kind of how we, we have this set up. So so we have to take this date, April 5th, 2030, as a symbol of something. It's a symbol, in, in this line, sort of we would say it's a symbol of the Sunday law, but we're not saying the Sunday law is happening April 5th, 2030. It's the third angel's message arriving whatever that's going to mean historically and whenever that's going to be historically, right, or futurely. Okay, so we don't know when the Battle of Paneum is, right? We don't have a date for it. You know, I don't even know if we have a symbolic date for it in this history. So so I'm not sure what what we do with that as far as we believe it's still future. And And, you know, so one thing we could do is we could say, well, maybe the April 5th, 2030 date should actually be there. So I'm going to do this because there as a symbol, this is where it reaches to. And this might make more sense that in this line, April 5th, 2030 just represents as a symbolic date, the Battle of Panean. Now, that's going to be the first day of the first month in 2030. <clears throat> Um, we could argue then that a symbolic date here for the Sunday law would be uh, the 10th day of the seventh month in 2030, which is October 8th, 2030. And that might make sense as well. But it would mean that this history from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month also has a history attached to it as symbols. That means you would have a midnight and a midnight cry in there. But remember, these are just symbolic dates. They're not, we're not saying something happens on April 5th, 2030. That is the Battle of Paneum. You know, the Sunday law doesn't happen October 8th, 2030. 
It's not what it's telling us. It just has these symbols, right? The 187 days from April 5th, 2030 to October 8th, 2030, right? From the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. But we don't know, right? So the Battle of Panea might happen in our history immediately, but it might be referring something to later in the future. And and the thing is, it may, there may be, maybe this January 6th, 2021 date that we're looking at that we're, in a sense, zooming into something that's just typical of what's going to happen, right? Because we know it's not the Battle of Raphia, the, the actual one that we have as, as midnight, because we have never got to midnight yet. So, you know, are we getting mixed up on how we're zooming into these lines in how we're interpreting these verses? That's what we don't know yet. So we, we may be, when we're drawing some of this interpretation in the present truth application, we're actually just zooming into our immediate history where these lines are actually telling us about something that's more zoomed out. But, it, you know, it could be that, you know, what happens with this Rosetta Stone if we take these symbols, that it can refer to something in our history immediately, but that's not really on the big line, right? Because remember, we're not making this application here on the big line because we don't know. We, we can't predict when midnight is going to be. We can't predict those events. We know that now. But we can look at the stuff happening immediately in our, in our history and understand where we are. Mostly we look at these things because as events unfold, it gives us more certainty in regard to our understanding of prophecy. It corrects us and it also gives us assurance. So any final thoughts? Yeah. So just, uh, you know, um, just for the record here, uh, Dwight just wanted to correct when he said Lincoln's first vice president was Hannibal Hamlin of Maine, not Skyler Colfax, because he was Grant's VP. Not that any of us would remember any of this, but somebody watching it might uh, pick up on it. Well, the, the point being that Hannibal Hamlin was the first vice president of the United States that was Republican. Oh, okay. So he set kind of a tone and I'd confuse the two because Colfax is one that that I had remembered for other reasons. Yeah, yeah. So before, yeah, with with uh, uh, connected with Grant. Right. So at this at this point, I just wanted to correct my error, mm -hmm. and you know, just be prepared, you know, from that. But there's you know, there's quite a bit with what we've looked at here that I think may have implications with what we're seeing going on right now within the U.S. because within two years of beginning that fifth Syrian war, you have Rome intervening. Mm -hmm. And what if with this, with this election cycle in the United States, we know that there is going to be another civil war really within this country, if it's not already occurring now. Yeah. And, and that's, yeah, and that's the thing that, you know, saying that there's this rebellion. Well, I mean, that rebellion sounds like a civil war. Right. And so so we may look at, you know, what's happening immediately is not really about, um, you know, this election per se. Like when we're dealing with uh, Rosetta Stone, that it's actually talking about something that's a little bit longer period of time. But. But it's hard to know until these events unfold. But at right. least we have it on our radar now that this Rosetta Stone might have some application to what's going to happen. Exactly. So so we're not making a prediction. We're not even suggesting anything. We're just simply saying this is part of that history. It has some symbols with it. And, you know, and, and there is another publishing date. There is November 27th, uh, 120 days previously which is just the anniversary of the inauguration of, of Ptolemy V, um, that the date is sometimes given on the, on the, the different uh, um, writings because you have the, the other stele and you have this Rosetta Stone. So 120 days, of course, is, is a symbol. What's the 120 days? Do we remember? 
Okay, so awesome. remember to do always close off off, off, off off probation during uh during all this time. The years, okay. one hundred and twenty years. Yeah, so it, it is there, but in our history we had taken because we we have 120 days before the issuing of the decree. The decree is a symbol of a message to the Levites. And remember back in 2014 when Jeff was first counting from the first day of the first month to the first day of the fifth month and then from the first day of the fifth month to the tenth day of the seventh month. He was counting 120 days and 70 days and that related to 12 and 7 priests and Levites. So 120 represents priests. It also is a symbol of Pentecost as well. So, and of course, Noah, right? Period of probation. But in this context, because it's 120 days before March 27th, which symbolizes 273, I would say it represents the priests, right? So the priests and the Levites, because the priests give a message to the Levites. So this Rosetta Stone that relates to the message to the Levites and the message of the priests to the Levites. That's just a suggestion. Okay. Well, thanks for that, everyone. Let's uh, close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness and love and um, for the study today. And we pray for your care, your care for our loved ones, and in the decisions that we make each day, that they can glorify you. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.